nine, seven, six, five. The Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations will come to order. The Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on preventing pandemics through U.S. wild borne disease surveillance. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the Chair and the Ranking mem Minority Member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing so, no objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the following members be permitted to ask questions of the witnesses at today's hearing. The member from Florida, Representative Soto. The member from Iowa, Representative Axney. The member from Illinois, Representative Quigley the member from Michigan, Representative Dingell. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or as described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Members physically present should provide a hard copy for staff to distribute by email. Please note that members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our fully in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. We'll begin with my opening statement and then I'll turn to Ranking Member Moore. We are here today to discuss a topic with consequences we all know too well the threat of wildlife-borne diseases becoming pandemics. Scientists believe that COVID-19 likely originated from a virus that jumped from wildlife to humans. We've unfortunately all learned that late detection can cost lives. The virus that causes COVID-19 occurs in 29 species that we know of, likely more. And it's not just COVID-19. 60% of emerging infectious diseases in humans come from animals. Although most of those diseases come from animals in the wild, Congress provides far less funding for the Department of Interior to monitor diseases in wildlife than it does for the Department of Agriculture to monitor diseases in domesticated animals. That is a use of taxpayer dollars that we need to correct. Recent scientific discoveries have made clear that wildlife continue to play a role in the pandemic. A study last month found that new variants of the coronavirus create, were created in Canada after being circulated in wild deer. The same study showed that deer have likely spread COVID-19 to humans. With an estimated 30 million deer in the US, that means there's no shortage of opportunities for the virus to mutate and then be passed back to people. Researchers conducting a study of deer in Iowa found that they were infected with the coronavirus at a rate as high as 80%. The study was only possible because the state of Iowa had been tracking deer for a different wildlife-borne disease, chronic wasting disease. The researchers used the state's archive samples and had to break through many barriers to test them. While this example shows how a little surveillance can go a long ways, it also shows that we need to be more intentional about monitoring the health threats in our own backyards. These outbreaks of wildlife-borne diseases shouldn't come as a surprise. Experts have been warning about them for years. Those same experts are now telling us that two of the biggest drivers of risk from wildlife-borne diseases are climate change and the frequency of interactions between wildlife and people. Both of those drivers are accelerating, which means we should expect more risk in the future, not less. Even wildlife-borne diseases we know well, such as the bubonic plague, need to be tracked so we can prevent them from causing catastrophic harm. Scientists, including Dr. Carlson, who's testifying here today, have found that the risk of bubonic plague is increasing and spreading to new areas in the West due to climate change. Experts warn that if we don't monitor the risk of bubonic plague closely, response times will be slower and outbreaks will be deadlier. The good news is that when we commit to systematic surveillance and rapid response, we can contain outbreaks of wildlife-borne diseases through regular monitoring of migratory birds, 
the source of highly pathogenic avian flu in the U.S., we've managed the risks of bird flu. If that spread had been unchecked, it would have posed a significant risk to human health, been economically devastating to commercial poultry operations, and resulted in the deaths of an unimaginable number of animals. I'm proud that this committee provided $45 million in the American Rescue Plan for states and tribes to improve surveillance of wildlife-borne diseases and rapid response efforts. This funding has already helped states prepare better for potential public health crises. But this one-time funding doesn't address the fragmented nature of surveillance in the U.S. right now, and much more is necessary to meet the need. Wildlife-borne diseases do not know state boundaries, so we need federal coordination and funding to address this problem. If we want to control outbreaks of wildlife-borne disease, we have to be able to see them. Tracking wildlife-borne disease helps us identify the source of an outbreak and predict where the next viral spillover into people will be. It could also help us stop the creation of new variants of a disease and prevent a pathogen from establishing itself in a species, as the coronavirus has in deer. There is already a well-funded, highly organized effort to track wildlife-borne diseases overseas, but we have no such effort here at home. I plan to change that with the help of experts like the ones testifying today. Thank you for appearing before this committee, and I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize Ranking Member Moore for his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Porter. We are facing several crises in America today, whether it's a health crisis, a border crisis, or an energy crisis. The work of this subcommittee should prioritize the most pressing issues at hand. As Americans face skyrocketing inflation and rising gas prices, we seem to spend time on hearings about almost anything other than addressing President Biden's ongoing energy crisis, most relevant to this committee's jurisdiction. The Biden administration continues to push policies that stifle domestic energy production and leaves us dependent on adversarial nations for energy, from canceling the Keystone Pipeline to refusing to hold statutorily mandated lease sales for over a year. The Biden administration hamstrings American energy production at every possible turn. The Interior Department should be answering for the delays they have caused in the permitting and leasing process for energy production on federal lands, which is why I introduced the Protecting Energy Independence and Transparency Act. Despite an even greater need for American energy, thousands of permits to, dr to drill and rights of ways are languishing before the Interior Department waiting for approval, and we'd like to know why. The administration must be held accountable for its counterproductive announcement on onshore lease sales earlier this month. The administration is raising royalty rates and only offering a small fraction of the acreage nominated for leasing. In my home state of Utah, the BLM is offering a one parcel for sale, one. Requiring higher royalty rates on these parcels will only drive up the cost of production at a time when Americans are paying record prices for gas. With rising energy costs and global insecurity threatened supply, now is the time to unleash American production. Yet the majority elected to present a narrow topic for today's hearing, the prevention of pandemics through disease surveillance in the United States. The majority's first and only government witness is from the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, US, USGS, to testify. As American families are forced to make their dollars stretch at home, I look forward to seeing if the USGS is appropriately st uh, stewarding taxpayer dollars and avoiding duplicative work just as one of, the many, one of the many federal agencies that conduct wildlife surveillance. While we can all agree preventing the next pandemic is important, we cannot simply limit our discussion to wildlife surveillance in this country. We know pandemics have global implications. Therefore, common sense dictates that combating the next pandemic will require international strategies to address these disease outbreaks and coordination among countries' surveillance efforts. Today, Ms. Catherine Semser, will share her vast ex expertise highlighting the importance of responsible management of ecosystems on the international stage. I look forward to discussing how conservation efforts, eliminating illegal wildlife trafficking, trafficking and accountability for bad actors all play a role in reducing the risk of the next pandemic. Ms. Semster's research on wildlife trafficking, environmental security, and the geopolitical implications of conservation will highlight the international ties woven into the pandemic prevention efforts. Responsible environmental management plays a crucial role in reducing the risk of disease spillover between species. When ecosystems are destroyed, species lose their habitats and are then crowded together. 
The close proximity of animals increases the chances of disease transformation between different species. For example, China's Belt and Road Initiative and the resulting practices of Chinese logging companies in Africa highlight this risks. That they highlight this risk. As companies' activities result in deforestation with the Congo Basin, ecosystems are destroyed and animals lose their home. The continuation of irresponsible logging practices will lead to greater habit, habit, habitat destruction. Ultimately, effective pandemic prevention is tied, um, is, tied, is, is tied to responsible management and development of our natural resources. Equally as important to pandemic prevention is combating illegal wildlife trafficking. This illicit practice heightens the risk of disease spread between species. Traffickers evade health inspections and crowd animals together as they transport them, increasing disease spillover. China is recognized as a leading consumer of wildlife products, including illegally trafficked products. Rather than relying on Chinese government to change their laws, we should assess steps the United States and other international allies can take to curtail illegal wildlife trafficking. These efforts to curb illegal wildlife trafficking, however, should not focus on blanket wildlife trade bans, but instead on targeted enforcement that is coordinated with local governments. We are serious about preventing the next pandemic. Bad actors must be held accountable. Until we successfully counter China's and other bad actors' dangerous practices, we will continue to face increased risks of wildlife-borne pandemics. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ranking Member Moore. Now I would like to turn to our first panel and introduce our government witness. Ms. Ann Kinzinger is the Associate Director for Ecosystems at the U.S. Geological Survey. Let me remind the witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin, and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members and witnesses joining virtually um, pin the timer so that it remains visible. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will, this is not relevant because you're only one witness, so I don't need to allow the entire panel to testify. Um, the chair is now um, happy to recognize Ms. Kinginger to testify. Good morning. Chair Porter, Ranking Member Moore, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to testify on wildlife diseases, especially zoonoses, which are pathogens that spread between humans and animals. As Chair Porter has already noted, this is a critically important issue and a review of emerging human infectious diseases going back to the 40s found, as she said, that approximately 60% of human diseases were zoonotic in nature, and of those, more than 70% of the originated in wildlife. USGS conducts disease surveillance and research supporting the federal response to zoonotic diseases that circulate in wildlife and in the environment. Our efforts to support a One Health approach that calls for close collaboration between the human health domesticated animal and wildlife sectors. In particular, it supports improved biosurveillance of wildlife diseases. As with many complex challenges, a whole of government approach is needed. And USGS scientists are working closely with other federal and state agencies, including the US Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, USDA, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. For example, we and our partners are developing a network that encompasses all aspects of wildlife disease surveillance, including incident reporting, prediction of threats, assessment of impacts, and selection of management options. This will strengthen the capabilities of all network partners, federal agencies, states, tribes, academia, and our international partners to predict, assess, and respond to, to disease threats quickly and effectively. Enhanced capabilities and additional science could better, better ensure that our stakeholders, such as resource managers, emergency responders, and the public health community, receive early warning and actionable science to inform disease response efforts. We are already moving forward on this endeavor by working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to begin development of a national wildlife disease database to provide early warning of wildlife diseases. This was funded under the American Rescue Plan. In addition, DOI funding provided by the CARES Act was used by USGS to initiate biosurveillance of coronaviruses in wildlife, in the environment, and municipal wastewater. This includes integrating SARS-CoV-2 surveillance into wildlife cause of death investigations, 
and active field surveillance, such as sampling around mink farms to support a USDA response. The USGS also incorporated SARS-CoV-2 sample collection into existing bat surveillance studies to ensure rapid detection should infections occur. Funds were also used to partner with the CDC National Wildlife Wastewater Surveillance System to provide local public, public health agencies with tests for community-level infections during a COVID-19 surge. The USGS can be nimble and responsive to these requests due to the capacity that has built, been built over decades to support the federal response to zoonotic diseases and to inform mitigation strategies which help protect both wildlife and the public health. The USGS maintains several important labs across the country, including the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin, which is the only federal biosafety level three lab dedicated to wildlife health. We also support two aquatic labs that study disease, our Western Fisheries Research Center in Seattle, Washington, and our uh, e Eastern Ecological Science Center in Kearneysville, West Virginia. Our labs, along with USGS wildlife disease experts located across the US, are supporting our partners with research, technology, and tools to tackle current and ongoing zoonotic diseases found on land and in water environments. These include coronaviruses, avian influenza, chronic wasting disease, rabies, sylvatic plague, brucellosis, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, salmonellosis, Lyme disease, avian malaria, and many others. In conclusion, the USGS, along with our partners, is leading research on wildlife disease and spearheading monitoring efforts that address diverse stakeholder needs. As the One Health approach implies, understanding wildlife disease is a crucial step in protecting the public from known and emergent diseases. That idea of studying the natural world to benefit all people is very much within the USGS tradition. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much um, for your testimony. Reminding members that Committee Rule 3D imposes a five-minute limit on questions. The chair will now recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask the witness. Just one minute. Mr. Soto, if you're ready, I'll recognize you first and, and we'll uh, delay my questioning to make sure we can keep members on their schedule. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you, Chair Porter, and I appreciate you being here, Ms. Kinzinger. Uh, just as a preliminary discussion of how we've gotten this right over the years, uh, you know, in 2016, we had a screwworm uh, outbreak among key deer in Florida that uh, would have been a huge issue for our uh, cattle ranches throughout Florida. Uh, yet, uh, because of the good work of U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, we were able to get that under control, sadly 135 deer had to be killed to be able to bring that into, uh, bring that into under control, but it shows that good work uh, can be done uh, to help out. Uh, but we did see uh, a more troubling menace in the Zika outbreak, uh, which we saw starting in places like South America and uh, eventually getting to my family's native island of Puerto Rico. Uh, Ms. Kinsinger, in your testimony, you mentioned that the USGS provided guidance to the Puerto Rico government about how to do mosquito control without killing off pollinators during the Zika outbreak, which is an important balance to strike. Can you tell me more about the specifics of that guidance and why were pollinators at risk? Yes, um, we have some limited uh, research in the Zika virus, uh, not only what you were talking about, but also in understanding the uh, disease, the ecology of mosquitoes, which of course are what cause Zika. Um, we have a role in understanding the ecology of species uh, throughout, including pollinators throughout the U.S. and understanding the ecological pathways of disease. And so our work here was uh, to try to understand the uh, unintended consequences of chemical applications to control mosquitoes. And I know this committee released a report in 2016 showing that forced budget cuts in Puerto Rico compromised the island's own ability to protect itself from the Zika virus, something that uh, threatened um, our great state of Florida as well. That outbreak was devastating for Puerto Rico. The kind of expertise and experience that you described strikes me as something the 
Puerto Rico government could not be expected to provide uh, under those circumstances. So having the assistance of USGS in a situation like that uh, is essential. Uh, does USGS continue to provide assistance to the island on Zika, uh, chikungunya, or other wildlife-borne diseases? And if so, what kind of uh, assistance? I don't believe we have any active Zika projects at the moment. Um, is there any other wildlife-borne uh, disease that you are uh, assisting with down in Puerto Rico? I'll have to get back to you on the record on that. I don't know. And what are some exa other examples of uh, services that USGS provides to states and territories to help them manage wildlife-borne diseases? So I did mention biosurveillance, which is key, and we've, we are developing with our partners a number of tools, uh, including genetic tools like the measuring uh, genetic components in environmental DNA and RNA. Uh, and we continue to do that sort of horizon scanning to see uh, when emergency diseases are detected. We also do invest investigations of outbreaks at our National Wildlife Health Center that I mentioned earlier in my oral testimony. And then, uh, again, ecological research is a key piece of this as we understand uh, both the vectors and the species that are at risk, understanding their, their distribution, uh, changes in their migratory patterns, perhaps due to climate change and other factors such as that. And Ms. Kinzinger, big picture, uh, with the warming climate and uh, states like Florida and territories like Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands, getting warmer weather. What does that mean ultimately for the threat of vector-borne diseases and how can we help you all address them? So in our FY23 budget, we do have an increase proposed to look at the effects of climate on wildlife diseases. We have a couple of instances um, in the United States where we have been working on this, um, precisely the types of areas I've already outlined. One is in the Northeast, looking at the di uh, distribution and movement of ticks that cause, of course, Lyme's disease, deer ticks, um, and looking at the effects of climate on the tick distribution and ultimately um, on wildlife health, such as moose in the Northeast, uh, going far across the country to the West. Uh, we worked in Hawaii uh, with our partners in Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, and others, looking at the spread of avian malaria in critically endangered Hawaiian forest birds. And what we're doing there is we are seeing that the mosquitoes are spreading up as climate warms and changes. They're moving up the mountains that are the last refugia for these critically endangered birds. And so we're in a multi-agency effort to look at uh, both the ecological conditions and uh, con potential control technologies to stop that uh, further spread. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, we now turn to Ranking Member Moore for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I, uh, Associate Director Kinzinger, I'd like to start today by getting a better understanding of how the U.S. Geological Survey works with other federal agencies to meet our wildlife surveillance goals. Uh, I'm going to ask questions about coordination how, uh, how you work with, where's their duplicative nature? And let me just say on the front end, this frustration of mine predates today. It predates my time in Congress. I've worked in, um, I've served in federal agencies uh, before, and this is, a, this is a problem across our entire government. Um, and, but we're gonna focus on specifically your area today, but this is something we have to get better. We have to, we, we just have to do this better because we are wasting taxpayers' dollars every single day by, by having, way too much duplicative work and making it too difficult for us to get to the root of the problem. Um, and your testimony highlighted the U.S. Geological Survey's collaboration with several agencies which also conduct wildlife surveillance. For example, the Fish and Wildlife Service just announced $9 million in grants focused on addressing zoonic outbreaks and the Agriculture, Agriculture Department received $6 million to study COVID-19, a specific zoonic disease in deer. Please describe the relationship between your agency and others conducting wildlife surveillance, including the Ag Department and the Fish and Wildlife Service. How often do you communicate with each other? Please provide some context here. Okay. Thank you. Um, as I noted in my oral testimony, such collaboration is absolutely critical. Um, and we do work very closely with uh, the agencies that I named and, and many others. 
the niche for the U.S. Geological Survey is in the study of wildlife diseases and the ecological condition that leads to spread of diseases. And we do work very closely with USDA. The example I would give you there is in avian influenza. When we do outbreak investigations at our National Wildlife Health Center to detect avian influenza, we then send those samples to the USDA for a verification. And we have a closely coordinated communication strategy in which the USDA does make those announcements. And so again, the focus of USDA is um, on domesticated animals and our focus is on uh, wildlife disease in uh, free-ranging animals in the wild. Um, another example would be chronic wasting disease. I sit with USDA on the chronic wasting disease task force that's managed out of the Department of Interior, has uh, USDA APHIS, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and many sister DOI bureaus in which we discuss new findings of chronic wasting disease, detection, priorities, uh, spread of the disease, mapping, and so on. So we do share information, uh, I think, quite well when it comes to chronic wasting disease. And could you share also like steps you take to make sure this work is not duplicative in nature? It is through those coordination meetings. Uh, again, I think we have a special niche that deals with wildlife disease uh, and uh, both the um, human health community and the agricultural community do look to us for that specialized expertise. Um, with respect to a cross-cut budget analysis, to your knowledge, has the, has the DOI, the Department of Interior, conducted a cross-cut analysis, analysis of all the department's wildlife surveillance programs? Uh, not to, I don't know, so okay. I'll get back to you on that. Um, yeah, <clears throat> without, without that type of budget, um, please do get back to us. If there is one, we'd love to, to, to be able to have a copy of it and, and, and dig into it with some of my, my staff. But without that, can you be confident the taxpayer dollars are being efficiently used if there's no assessment of how money is being spent through separate agencies working towards the same goal? I think that analysis could be useful, but I am confident because of the degree of coordination and collaboration and communication that we have that we are spending ta taxpayer dollars wisely. Professor Carlson, a witness on the next panel, noted in his testimony that because wildlife disease surveillance is, quote, fragmented across these institutions, end quote, that it could take a researcher months or years to find the data necessary to answer one question. Kind of my, my prelude here when I, when I started this questioning uh, issue that I have. It's, it's unacceptable. Um, your testimony noted that your agency had begun developing a national wildlife sis, uh, disease database. How will you prioritize addressing the problem highlighted here by Professor Carlson as you create this database? Thank you for that question. So the National Wildlife Disease Database is built on a current system that we have called WISPERS, Wildlife Incident Reporting System, after, uh, at our National Wildlife Health Center. It already serves as a centralized place where incidents can be reported and additional information be included. So we're building from that outward to a system that will be accessible to all, where incidents can be reported, but also where we can combine ecological and environmental information and work with the community to develop risk assessments, um, look at adaptive management strategies, and generally just help managers bring the science together to address these concerns. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Huffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Kinziger, appreciate you being here. And um, I noted uh, you made a reference, a passing reference in your testimony to mink farming and to um, some surveillance work that USGS is doing. I, I think we're gonna try to get our heads around this subject um, of animal uh, wildlife borne uh, diseases in the context of this current pandemic. We need to talk about mink a little bit more. Uh, I am told that, you know, even though there are some anecdotes about cats and big cats uh, getting COVID, um, mink are really the, the species where we know it has gone back and forth between humans uh, and actually mutated uh, within mink populations and then come back to us. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we produce millions of minks uh, in mink farms in the United States. Uh, for export, I, I'm told, mainly to China. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little more about um, the, 
the level of concern we should have about uh, these mink farms as a vector for the spreading uh, of COVID and potentially you know, creating a, a mutation laboratory almost here in the United States simply so that we can sell uh, furs to China. So yes, I do think it's a serious concern, um, as it is with other animals, uh, both domesticated and wild, that that uh, not only are affected by COVID-2, but also can um, serve as reservoirs for potential transmission back to humans and also to other wildlife. The USGS role in the mink farm surveillance really did focus on uh, wildlife surrounding the mink farms, and we did uh, did test a large number of animals. I think the number was 365, and it did show um, uh, quite a lot of uh, presence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in those animals. So what are you doing about that? Um, we're continuing to raise and export these minks, uh, as I understand it, uh, back and forth to China, of all places, in the middle of this pandemic. Um, isn't this something that we should uh, be sounding the alarm about, looking into, taking action? Well, I think, you know, as I say, the USGS role really is in looking at the wild animals. We work closely with those who do make those sorts of management and policy decisions, but I wouldn't want to speak for them. So you are purely looking at uh, the wildlife in the area around the mink farms. Do I understand that That's correct. correctly? Yes. And that response is being led by USDA, and so our information has been given to USDA to help in their uh, very difficult management decision. And I, I think in your words, you said you were finding quite a bit of COVID just in that um, surrounding uh, wildlife uh, tracking that you're doing. Is it fair to assume that the level of COVID within the mink farm itself, where these animals are confined and uh, presumably don't even have a lot of interaction with um, the, the surrounding environment, it, 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 wouldn't it be fair to assume that we might have an even bigger problem within the mink farms? Well, it is definitely true that a animals that congregate do have higher levels of transmission, yes. Okay. Um, now, is, is this a, I'm, I'm a little surprised, frankly, that um, we're not hearing more uh, from you about that, but maybe that's just a function of USGS and jurisdictional lines that constrain you. Um, so, you know, maybe there are other witnesses that can speak to this, but are there other authorities or resources that you would want um, to do more about what seems like a pretty clear and present danger uh, posed by these mink farms? Well, I think, uh, as I mentioned in the 23 budget, we do have uh, some uh, ample funding to look at wildlife diseases in the wild. Uh, we did receive some specific increases in our 22 omnibus bill as well, um, but there's always room to expand our capacity. Um, and as I said, these are decisions that are informed by the science of USGS, but there are a lot of factors that go into making those decisions. All right. Well, I, I appreciate your testimony and I understand the limitations that, that you're under there, uh, but my understanding is that of all the animals that we might concern ourselves with, uh, you know, mink should be perhaps at the top of the list in terms of the known transmission of this virus back and forth between minks and humans and the known mutations that have already arisen from that and the volume of uh, mink farming and uh, the trade back uh, between the United States and China. I mean, these are all huge red flags. So, um, Madam Chairman, thanks so much. I yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. The, the uh, USGS collaborates with numerous other partners to conduct uh, wildlife surveillance. I'd like to go there if we can for a few moments. What type of metrics uh, do, do you have in place to assess the value of these partnerships? That's a really good question. I don't think we have been using specific quantitative metrics. Certainly, I think it can be measured by the speed of our, the rapidity of our response to detected outbreaks, um, to uh, the ability to communicate quickly and effectively with those who do have to make difficult public health and, and agricultural sector decisions. 
Um, but I'm not aware of any particular metrics that we've been using to measure our success. So you just kind of play it by ear and determine the whole? Well, I don't know if we're playing it by ear because we do have uh, plans such as the avian influenza um, response plan and many other plans in place that, that uh, are but you're But there are no metrics to determine to the knowledge. overall value. Uh, what, what about on the funding side of things? Uh, what kind of tracking mechanisms are in place to monitor uh, funds that are awarded to partners for wildlife surveillance? So I think that's a question uh, um, for better put to the granting agencies. We, we were involved, uh, for example, in the criteria that were developed for the Fish and Wildlife Service grants to states and tribes to look at wildlife disease, and we did ask that, um, that those measures include information being put into the National Wildlife Disease Database I mentioned, but I'm not, I'm not familiar with what the metrics they're using for success. So again, there's no real tracking of the I funding of it all either. No, I believe there is tracking. I'm just not familiar with it because they aren't, they aren't programs. Okay, well, if we could get that information. I'd be happy to do that. Um, it's come up with others about uh, duplicate type uh, uh, scenarios here. How do you prevent partners from duplicating wildlife surveillance work? Well, as I mentioned in my oral testimony, I think uh, we've, we're doing a better and better job. I wouldn't say we're where we need to be, but a better and better job of a national coordinated biosurveillance effort. As one example, the, Amer uh, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, with, which represents state fish and wildlife agencies uh, across the country, passed a resolution in support of biosurveillance of disease. I sit on their national Fish and Wildlife Health Steering Committee. I sit on their steering committee for the National Wildlife Health Initiative, and we've been working closely on making sure that we bring our information together and that um, the federal agencies, uh, which don't manage a lot of these species, serve as a support function for the state agencies in doing things like risk assessments and doing things like bio Well, that, that's good if I may, because I don't have much time. That's, that's good that you're doing that, but the question is how do you prevent uh, duplicating? Why, and and yeah. you're not really answering that question. How is that prevented? I believe it's prevented through the regular meetings and collaborations we have. Okay, is there, are there any metrics to determine the effectiveness of those meetings to make sure duplicative uh, work is not uh, occurring? Again, I'm not aware of any quantitative metrics. I think the quality of our response is probably the best best way to look Do at that. Do you think it would be a good idea to have some metrics? And I, I could definitely take that back to our community and get back to you on that. Okay, uh, I think that would probably be a good idea. I'd like to transition, if I can, about uh, how your agency provides uh, information to the CDC. Can you kind of walk us through that uh, process from USGS's uh, when you detect a disease uh, to when uh, your agency alerts the CDC of the findings? What's the process there? So um, there, there are different processes depending on the disease. As I mentioned with avian influenza, our primary partner there is the USDA. But for uh, other diseases, uh, we have a vast network of collaborators that we um, share our results with all the time. We also release what we call technical bulletins from our National Wildlife Health Center that goes out to all the key decision makers in multiple federal and state agencies. What kind of steps are taken to verify your findings uh, before initiating the process? How do you know that you know what you're doing? So um, we certainly try to design our research so it's replicable, and we do multiple tests when we do them. And in some cases, we do have independent labs like the USDA verify our results. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Dingell, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really want to thank you and Ranking Member Moore for convening this important and timely hearing on wildlife-borne disease surveillance. It's important to note that in addition to COVID-19, we have to be mindful of spillovers of other zoonotic diseases that could pose significant public health risks to Americans. In fact, even prior to the current pandemic, there was a historic outbreak of Eastern Equinine Enceladus in Michigan in 2019 
that infected 10 people, killing six and leaving at least one survivor with permanent disabilities. For comparison, in an average year, there are seven cases of this disease in the entire United States. So we have to take seriously this potential threat to America, America's public health and ensure that there are appropriate systems in place for surveillance and detection of these types of diseases. Uh, Ms. Kissinger, in your testimony, you speak about how experimental research discovered potential for previously unknown wildlife-to-wildlife -wildlife transmission in the West Nile virus, another mosquito-borne disease. Could more wildlife disease research help warn us about the new risks to human health, and how? Yes, I believe uh, greater surveillance could help in warning about the risk. Um, and specifically, I mentioned the use of uh, genetic capabilities, so uh, not a disease example, but uh, for example, um, learning to detect Asian carp in the Great Lakes. We developed these field tests where samples could be analyzed on the spot uh, to detect for the presence of Asian carp, and I think tools and technologies like that would be a significant boost to our uh, national network of biosurveillance. So building on that, in your testimony, you talk about the development of a test for eDNA. Is that the same eDNA that has been essential in tracking invasive carp near the Great Lakes? Yes. How has that technology changed the way we manage invasive carp? Yes, yes that, that is the technology I was referring to. Environmental DNA is uh, when you search for DNA in waters and soils and plants and the like. And um, I think that's essential for early detection because if you wait for, um, well, in the case of chronic wasting disease, for example, animals don't appear to be sick, don't show symptoms for months at a time. And so it's really important to detect these uh, disease agents early on, either in the live animals or in the environment. But then how does that technology help us manage it better? Yes, detect, but how does it help manage? What do we do? So uh, a couple examples. One, the key is, uh, particularly as I mentioned, combining our eco ecological research, which understands how animals move, where they go. Um, we've uh, done work in avian influenza, for example, to look at the, um, the overlap between wild and domesticated birds. Um, and certainly human interaction. So all of those factors would allow our us to predict today, so where these diseases the might occur the um, before they get oh, there. Doors, doors, and then we and can put in place uh, biomanagement, oh, yeah. um, biosecurity measures to prevent that spread. Heavy for breakfast. Um, I was just going to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Someone well, needs to mute their mic. The <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who it is, but. Hey, yeah. Steve, you got to mute. Sorry. You figured, figured out who it was. Thank you, Jared. Last question. Can you discuss USGS's Whispers database? How does this help track the sorts of public health concerns we've discussed today? So the Whispers database is a, a wildlife incident reporting system. Um, it's housed at our National Wildlife Health Center. And what it does is serve as a central place for uh, reports of incidents of wild disease, wildlife disease that occur throughout the nation. And so um, it's a widely used database right now for people to um, scan and do this sort of horizon scanning to detect um, incidences uh, as they occur in real time. We're also building on that Whispers database for our National Wildlife Disease Database to add in additional information, ecological information, environmental information, and the capacity to employ even more predictive tools and technologies. Thanks. Thanks for the work that you're doing, and Thanks. Madam Chair, for having um, this hearing. Michigan's been a place that we saw the transmission of COVID as well from Mankin. We care a lot about this, and I yield back the balance of my seven seconds. Thanks, Madam Chair. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, for five minutes. Starting my video, and I'm muting, I think. Have I started my, start my video? I'm going to let you be the cameraman. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for having this hearing. Uh, we are at three committees going concurrently, and so we thank you for your efforts in this important panel. Uh, 
approximately 25 months ago, we learned about coronavirus, and it was a scary uh, worldwide uh, health issue, and it was estimated that maybe 400,000 so people might die around the world. Well, now we've seen already a million people die. Uh, that virus has told us a lot about pathogens and how they can affect humans as well as animals. Uh, we've had over 80 million confirmed cases in the U.S. with those 100, almost a million deaths. Worldwide, it's more like 6.2 million. Uh, we need to ensure that the United States understands how the interaction with climate change, wildlife, and humans can have an impact on diseases and future, potential future pandemics. Ms. Kissinger, you may be aware, I hope you are, that an unknown pathogen that has killed at least 85 horses at the Bureau of Land Management's Canyon City Wild Horse and Burrow Facility in Colorado since uh, Saturday, April 23. I attended a meeting of individuals, uh, quite a few in Washington for a national conference on the horse management and wild burrows. And they brought this up, brought this to my attention. The infected horses are initially identified with respiratory difficulties and then they suffered neurological effects. The Bureau of Land Management has reported that federal and private veterinarians are working to determine the cause, but they haven't figured it out yet. The facility holds currently holds 2,500 horses. Now it's down to a, a, approximately 2,400. So 3.5% of the horses in that confinement have died in the last week. Um, Bob Baffert has not been seen around that, those horses. Um, these horses are kept in close quarters. If they were not pinned, it is entirely possible that, that the, path, the pathogen would have not spread nearly as quickly. Are these types of outbreaks that the our USGS ecosystem program typically studies? We do study disease outbreaks, um, and I am aware of this outbreak in wild horses, although that is not something that we have been involved in. Um, I did uh, put out a request to our National Wildlife Health Center to see if they'd been involved, and they have not to date. Uh, but we have a very close working relationship with the Bureau of Land Management. We've done other non-disease related work on wild horses, and um, I, so I'd be happy to keep the committee apprised of, of uh, any additional information that comes out of that. If you would, the disease and the death is certainly disturbing, and that's the subject of this hearing, but I'm concerned about the horses and the burrows in general, so if you'd let us keep us informed on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, th th these, as we know, they could affect other than this, the horses, we don't know. Um, and, and the Bureau of Land Management has not been very uh, effective in, in, in this process. The ranchers like to use that land out there, which they pay ridiculously low uh, fees for, a dollar per uh, cow, uh, which hasn't been changed a month, which hasn't been changed that fee for a couple of decades. And the cows are about twice as large now, so they eat a lot more, but it should be more like $20 based on 20 years and, 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 and the size of the cows, but they we subsidize it. You know, sometimes you, you heard the expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, when the Bureau of Land Management's involved with cattle ranchers, it seems like there is such a thing as a free lunch. And then they move the horses away because they say the horses are eating the, veget the, 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 the raw materials there and, and the horses get pinned up and taken and sometimes they end up being shipped off to Mexico. However, people buy them, but they're not supposed to. But the horses, the burros are at risk the programs they've had, and we want, we'd be looking into having a hearing on this to see that this is done in a humane fashion and that the burrows and the horses are looked upon uh, with, they, they should have rights in those lands to graze. They are an American treasure. Uh, do you have any other information or knowledge of the, the BLM and their horse burrow policy? Oh, no, I can't speak to their specific policies, um, but as I said, USGS has worked with BLM on a couple things. One is um, in helping to improve their monitoring protocols so that we understand how many horses are out there in the wild and then um, looking at uh, reproductive capacities, uh, reproductive techniques uh, for slowing the reproduction of the horses. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of Trigger and all the other horses of, of, of past and present, uh, I appreciate your looking into that and I yield back the balance of my time. Happy to. Thank you very much. Um, the chair now will recognize herself for her questions. Um, Ms. Kinjiger, you said earlier that there is always room to expand capacity, um, and you made a kind of general statement that there's, there's, the, there's the potential to improve. 
I agree with my Republican colleague, Mr. Moore. Taxpayers deserve to know that their money is being spent effectively. And public health is an investment. It can save money. Um, pandemics are devastatingly expensive, which is something that I think we can find bipartisan agreement about. It is fiscally responsible to give USGS the necessary funding and to hold it to account on how it uses that funding. And so I want to invite Mr. Moore to work with me in a bipartisan way on legislation to try to improve coordination, save resources, um, and be able to do a better job with the funding that we are giving to prevent future pandemics. So I want to ask you to be as specific as you can be with the committee. Um, if we were to give you more funding, what would you do differently? How would it protect the American economy and the American public? So I'll take that last piece first. I, I, um, we often talk about the direct effects of pandemics, for example, the billions of dollars in poultry that have to be destroyed during an avian influenza outbreak. Um, but there's also a huge cost associated with preparing for pandemics and preparing to respond to pandemics. So it's, um, it's probably an even larger price tag than folks realize. Um, in terms of what we would do with additional capacity, um, that, that would be on several fronts. One would be to um, expand on our outbreak investigations, uh, to be there at the table immediately when, um, for example, when a wild bird is found dead, uh, to be able to test it immediately for, um, for any, any disease. We would do tests on a suite of diseases. The other, as I've mentioned several times, is in the biosurveillance realm the ability to develop these rapid markers for detecting disease, and, and by the way, this is also very useful in invasive species as well, which are a billion dollar cost to the, the economy. And then also continue to invest in ecological research because it's critically important to understand how animals move, how they interact with domesticated animals and humans. And just to give one example of that, we've been studying migratory birds for decades now. Um, started with the hunting community and making sure that we could work with um, state managers on their harvest strategies. But when the avian influenza appeared in 2006, USGS was right there with the ma worldwide maps of migratory patterns. Um, and so we were able to quickly see that areas of migratory bird layovers in areas that had uh, avian influenza outbreaks were critical sources for um, avian influenza entering the United States. We established a monitoring program in Alaska for the, with the Fish and Wildlife Service so that we could test birds coming in on that flyway, the Pacific flyway, um, to try to rapidly detect AI. So I think there's a lot that can be done in that, in the ecological research as well. So uh, I hear you say rapid, develop rapid markers. Um, ecological research, which I think you did a terrific job of explaining. Um, I wanted to ask you about our next panel is going to talk, I, I think, a lot about data. Um, and so I wanted to ask you specifically about um, central repositories of data, about whispers, the database. If you could explain that to the committee and talk about how we could improve that. And then specifically, I, I'd invite you to respond in more detail to what Mr. Moore raised about Department of Agriculture and coordination across departments, because I, I hear a strong willingness to coordinate. I'd like to know if we gave you more resources could you coordinate better, and what would that look like? Um, so I'll answer the last first, and I may have to ask you to repeat the first. <laughs> um, so we have uh, significantly ramped up our coordination with agriculture, and I think I've talked about that. I think the most important mechanisms um, are to have specific pathways for sharing information. We have some really specific protocols in place, as I mentioned, for avian influenza. We can do that with multiple diseases and early detection. Um, we have, as I say, as part of that strategy, a uh, joint communication strategy. We understand who makes the first, in, uh, who conducts the first tests, who validates that, and then mo most importantly, who communicates that and how. Um, and that has, particularly with diseases that have significant economic impacts, we have to be very thoughtful about how we communicate those diseases. And with apologies, could you repeat the first question? <laughs> Yes. Um, the first now. Oh, the first question was about whispers and centralized yes, data. Yes. So um, it is really important to have a central source of data. I think that um, that it's uh, a huge cost alone just to have researchers out there looking for where they can find collaborators and information. 
So the Whispers database has been in place for some time at the National Wildlife Health Center, or the Whispers stands for Wildlife Incident Reporting System. Um, and we, we already are used by many, many partners um, who put not, not only input data on the incidence of disease, but also use it to um, do conduct health assessments, risk assessments, and the like. Um, with the ARPA funding, the f which went to the Fish and $45 million went to the Fish and Wildlife Service, of that, $6.5 million uh, came from Fish and Wildlife to USGS to expand that system into a national wildlife disease database. So we'll build on the incident reporting capacity that we already have a place in Whispers, but become more of a, even more of a decision support tool by incorporating environmental data, uh, ecological data, um, and uh, most importantly, some web-based tools so that folks can get in there, see the incident, conduct risk assessments, and use that information to make their on-the-ground management decisions. Thank you very much. Um, I think we are now, unless there are any other members who wish to question on this panel, I think we're now ready to transition to our second panel. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Kinjinger, for your testimony. We'll now pause while we reset for the second panel. testified before. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, uh, you testified two years ago in the Senate hearing on wildlife. I did, yeah. Very, very big stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to just be talking about some of the same issues. I mean, they're not resolved. Right? They're not resolved, exactly. And the work you all are doing is critical. Um, but it's a, it's a mosaic of approaches, right? You know, it's not, there's no civil, silver bullet. My boss uh, said that uh, I should connect with you afterwards. Brian Yablonski, I think you were on a panel together some some months ago. Oh, on what? Do you know what the topic was? I forget, <laughs> but um, I'd love to chat with you because we're doing a lot now on Native American issues. Sure, so. that'd be great. I did a lot of speaking during the pandemic. I'm sorry? I did a lot of speaking during the pandemic. Yeah, I think we all did. Yeah, it's like, what else am I going to do? <laughs> Do another Zoom speaking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it seemed like every week I was either moderating a panel or on a panel. <laughs> Where's Brian at? Uh, Property and Environment Research Center, Perk. Yeah. <clears throat> This is my fifth time, um, fourth time on this particular issue. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. All right, we're now going to uh, go ahead with the second panel. Um, before introducing our witnesses, I want to remind non-administration witnesses that they are encouraged to participate in the Witness Diversity Survey created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer to their hearing invitation for further information. Now I'm going to introduce our witnesses. Um, we have Dr. Carl Colin Carlson. He's an assistant professor, uh, research professor at the Center for Global Health Science and Security, Georgetown University Medical Center. We have Dr. David Stalknecht. Naked. I'm going to get this one wrong. Dr. David Stalknecht. 
There you go. Dr. David Stolknecht is the director of the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study and a professor in wildlife health at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Georgia. Uh, Ms. Catherine Semser is a research fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center. And Dr. Julie Thorstenson is the executive director of the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. As with the first panel, oral statements will be limited to five minutes, but your entire statement will be made part of the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will start and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining and red when your time has expired. After the witness has testified, uh, witnesses have testified, members will be given the opportunity to ask questions. Um, we're gonna start now um, with Dr. Carlson and so the chair recognizes you for your testimony. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Porter, Ranking Member Moore, and distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify in today's hearing. Uh, my name is Colin Carlson. I am an assistant professor at Georgetown University. I am an author on the most recent uh, report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I am the director of Verena, a scientific research team working to predict and prevent viral emergence. I want to share three conclusions with you today that I've drawn about how we can better monitor for disease emergence within the borders of our nation. First, the United States faces a substantial threat both from zoonotic disease and from complacency about the domestic risk it poses. It's easy to imagine pandemics are someone else's problem. The risk of disease emergence is higher in tropical countries with more biodiversity, weaker health systems, and high-risk interfaces like wildlife markets that allow viruses to jump from animals to humans, but risk only goes so far when you're planning for a once in a generation event. We live alongside wildlife and alongside zoonosis, even here in the nation's capital. In March, the CDC reported that in 2018, our local rat problem was responsible for two cases of hemorrhagic fever called Sewell hantavirus. Only a few weeks later, a rabid fox bit Representative Barra just outside this building. Thanks to the miracle vaccines, the congressman is safe, healthy, and back at work, but the stakes of these encounters can be much higher and deadlier. In fact, the deadliest pandemic in recent history started within our borders. Though it's often called Spanish flu, the 1918 pandemic of influenza was first detected on a military base in Kansas and is believed to have originated on a nearby farm. This could happen again today. A pandemic can start anywhere. Second, the risk posed by zoonotic disease is growing rapidly. One reason in particular stands out. One of the subcommittee's mandates is to investigate the sources and impacts of climate change, the single biggest issue that affects every aspect of the committee's work. A growing body of evidence now suggests that climate change could also become the single biggest issue for pandemic prevention and preparedness. In a study published only a few hours ago today in the journal Nature, our team reports that as mammal species are forced to track warming temperatures towards the Arctic and up mountainsides, Zoonotic diseases will arrive at new places and encounter new animals, some of which will serve as a stepping stone to reach a human host. Every simulation we conducted was unambiguous. Climate change is creating innumerable hotspots of future pandemic risk right in our backyard. We also believe this process is well underway. In 2004, a virus closely related to measles called Focine Distemper Virus was first reported in Alaskan sea otters. Working with state and federal agencies, a team of researchers has spent the last 15 years monitoring wildlife health throughout the Northern Pacific. They found that melting Arctic sea ice appears to have removed barriers to animal movement, allowing the virus to spread between otters, seals, and sea lions. Now, Focine distemper virus is unlikely to ever pose a threat to human health, but as we spotlight in our study, the same process will happen to the hosts of Ebola virus and coronaviruses and any other zoonotic disease, even here at home in the United States. Third, to face that growing risk, the most urgent priority is surveillance. Our country leads the world in zoonotic disease research, but modernizing our surveillance system, sharing data more openly, and increasing connections among state and federal agencies would do immeasurable good. For example, in a recent study, we found that since 1950, climate change has increased the risk of bubonic plague in the Western United States by up to 40% in some areas. We were only able to detect that thanks to decades of both human case surveillance by public health agencies and the wildlife data collected by the USDA's National Wildlife Disease Program. 
However, data also accounts for our study's biggest limitation. The California Department of Public Health has long curated its own independent surveillance system for plague, and the absence of that data creates a noticeable hole in our risk maps. Any steps we take towards more comprehensive, connected, and open zoonotic surveillance will massively benefit scientific efforts to predict and prevent the next pandemic. It's easy to miss in all the other pandemic science, but our field's currently headed into something of a scientific revolution. We can do things today we couldn't do a decade ago, like identify animal viruses with zoonotic potential only hours after we've sequenced their genome. We're headed in leaps and bounds towards true prediction. All of that exists by the grace of scientific data and the patchwork of programs the federal government funds to consolidate, collect, and immortalize that data. Building a more centralized infrastructure for zoonotic disease surveillance could easily be the lowest cost, highest return way to make our country more prepared, not just for pandemics, but for climate change. I look forward to discussing this with you further, and we'll gladly answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlson. The chair will now recognize um, Dr. David Stockneck to testify. All right. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify for the subcommittee. I'm currently employed at, by the University of Georgia as a professor and director of the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study. I'm giving this testimony today uh, not as a representative of UGA or SQUIDIS, but as an individual with over 40 years of experience conducting surveillance and research related to diseases affecting wildlife, domestic animals, and human health. Much of this work has centered on zoonotic pathogens that were not present in North America or known to exist when I began my career. Discussions related to wildlife and pandemic prevention require perspective. To provide this, I will address three questions. Can pandemics be prevented? I've lived through at least five pandemics in my lifetime, and all of them have involved viruses that originated from wildlife. These included three influenza pandemics, 1957, H2N2, 1968, H3N2, 2009 pandemic H1N1, originating from wild birds and domestic animals, HIV in 1981 from old world primates, and COVID-19 2019 presumed to originate from bats. None of these were predicted. With no pathogens and defined drivers of pathogen emergence, however, prevention may be possible. But with an unknown inventory of perhaps millions of potential and ever-changing pathogens in nature and in human-impacted ecosystems, pandemic prevention might be as futile as attempting to prevent a hurricane. However, like a hurricane, there is much that can be accomplished with preparedness to better protect the public and reduce impacts. Prevention should be the ultimate goal, but preparedness is probably a more realistic and practical approach in the near future. How can wildlife health professionals and improved infrastructure contribute to pandemic prevention and preparedness? The involvement and inclusion of wildlife health professionals is needed for many reasons. Zoonotic diseases and impacts are shared between wildlife, domestic animals, and humans, and pandemic, pandemic prevention and preparedness are dependent on a comprehensive understanding of the natural history of these pathogens in wildlife reservoirs and the potential for human and interspecies infection. Knowledge and expertise in basic wildlife biology and wildlife health and an understanding of the human-wildlife interactions are needed to fully understand these complex systems complex interactions. Laboratory and diagnostic capabilities specifically directed at wildlife also offer unique challenges, and these capabilities need to be in place and work ready. Finally, wildlife health professionals are on the front line related to disease detection and identification of problems associated with wildlife-human interactions. What are the current gaps related to building a pandemic prevention and preparedness capabilities. A broader wildlife health perspective is needed. It is important not to compartmentalize our efforts and capabilities into diseases only affecting wildlife, diseases affecting wildlife and domestic animals, and zoonotic diseases. There is significant overlap in the necessary skills, training, and field and laboratory infrastructure needed to understand diseases in wildlife populations are the same regardless of the host at risk. Support for both surveillance and research are needed. Surveillance approaches, capabilities, and effectiveness cannot be improved or even understood or, or, or developed 
without a basic understanding of infection, disease, or transmission processes. Sustainable funding is needed and, needed and, and recognition that success most often requires a long haul approach. Goals related to pandemic prevention and preparedness cannot be achieved through a boom and bust funding trajectory based on a short term response to the current crisis. And finally, within state wildlife health infrastructure and professional resources need to be better supported. This is perhaps the biggest gap. State wildlife health professionals are the frontline troops and are the critical part of our national wildlife disease network. But with few exceptions, in-state cap capabilities are not even close to being adequate. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, the chair now recognizes Ms. Catherine Semsor to testify. Good morning, Chair Porter, Ranking Member Moore, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The annual threat assessment by the U.S. Director of National Intelligence has identified pandemic disease as one of the preeminent threats to the security of the United States. The assessment has also identified the degradation of ecosystems as a contributing factor to this threat. This threat is embodied in the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. While the exact origins of the pandemic are still unknown, a majority of U.S. intelligence agencies and a large body of peer-reviewed literature has expressed confidence that those origins are likely natural with a genesis in wildlife. The global tragedy we are witnessing indicates how permeable the line is between our civilization and those parts of the world we deem wild. Wildlife-borne pathogens capable of incapacitating millions and shutting down the global economy have shown themselves to already be inside our door. Scientists warn that diseases capable of far more reaching destruction may await us in the planet's remaining wildlands, areas our civilization has increasing contact with via the pathways created by unsustainable development. Disturbances to wild landscapes, such as road building and land clearing, like that often pursued by Chinese interests in Africa, increase the chance of viral spillover occurring because they increase opportunities for human contact with wildlife hosting diseases or disease variants that pose a risk to public health. These disturbances can also increase the density of wildlife more likely to be considered a high risk for disease transmission and spillover, such as bats by altering the habitat to one more favorable to these species. For example, recent outbreaks of the Ebola virus, which is carried by bats in Central and West Africa, have shown a strong correlation with deforestation events. For this reason, the maintenance of intact, healthy ecosystems is considered a first line of defense against future pandemics. By keeping remote areas remote, the likelihood of people coming into contact with wildlife carrying pathogens that present a risk to public health is reduced in the stated objective of the current U.S. national security strategy to contain bio threats at their source is advanced. A proven way to maintain intact, healthy ecosystems is with incentives provided by the legal trade in wildlife and wildlife products. Economic and livelihood benefits provided by wildlife trade can encourage people to avoid the kinds of intrusions and land clearing that can impair the ecosystems the traded species rely on for their survival. A prominent example of this is the international trade in hunting trophies from African countries. This trade involves the sale and transport of tens of thousands of hides and horns around the world annually with revenues from their sale accruing to landowners, communities, and national conservation authorities. This trade has been credited with providing the economic incentive to conserve more than 344 million acres of remote areas, including those in countries considered to be hotspots of emerging wildlife-borne diseases. Unlike black markets, regulated legal trade provides the opportunity to have checkpoints to ensure disease is not being spread. To ensure that African hunting trophies are not a pathway by which wildlife foreign diseases spill over into the human population, the U.S. requires that unfinished hides and feathers be processed by an establishment approved by USDA to ensure that any pathogens which may be present are destroyed. This, reason, this requirement is one reason why there is no documented case of African hunting trophies contributing to the spread of wildlife-borne diseases. It also demonstrates that we can put into place policies and programs that limit the likelihood of future pandemics that, quote, save lives, protect livelihoods, and safeguard nature, as the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has recommended. USDA-approved facilities handling hunting trophies are potentially important nodes in the information network contributing to disease surveillance. With the right tools and relationships, these facilities can document the presence and trends of pathogens that may be present in specific species or from specific areas. 
This information can then be used to alert wildlife and public health officials to potential problem areas and emerging threats. Working with African nations to fully engage these facilities as partners in disease surveillance programs should be a priority, and these partnerships should then be looked to as a potential model for how to marry legal, sustainable wildlife trade with disease surveillance. The threat of pandemics stemming from wildlife-borne diseases is ever-present. Conserving intact healthy ecosystems at home and abroad is our first line of defense against this threat. The example of African hunting trophies demonstrates that legal trade in wildlife can enable ecosystem conservation and be managed to ensure its safety. The regulatory structure of this trade also provides opportunities for expanded disease surveillance partnerships that could serve as a model for other forms of trade in wildlife and wildlife products. These opportunities should be explored further to reduce the likelihood of future pandemics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the chair now recognizes Dr. Julie Thornson to testify. Julie Thornson, Good morning. My name is Julie Thornson. My Lakota name is Woksapi Kigu Hamniwia. I am Lakota and a citizen of the, North, the Cheyenne River Student Nation in North Central South Dakota. I'm glad to be here as Executive Director of the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society, a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to assist Native American and Alaska Native tribes with the preservation, conservation, and enhancement of their fish and wildlife resources. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on the importance of including tribes in prevention of pandemics through U.S. wildlife borne disease surveillance. I personally have a unique perspective on this topic, having begun my career as a wildlife biologist for my tribe and also having served as their health department CEO. Unfortunately, many times I found, my, found myself in a state of reaction in both jobs due to severe underfunding and lack of capacity for tribes. Today I'm going to focus on the threats to tribes and the importance of including them in every stage from prevention and planning to implementation and monitoring. The COVID-19 pandemic had devastating impacts to Indian country with the CDC and Indian Health Service reporting higher levels of infections, hospitalizations and deaths as a result of COVID-19 among American Indian and Alaska Native persons compared to non-Hispanic white persons. Nearly 9,000 deaths of American Indian and Alaska Native individuals were attributed to novel coronavirus in the U.S. at the end of December 2021. While the number of deaths is overwhelming, what cannot be truly quantified is the amount of knowledge we have lost, the language speakers, the cultural experts, and unknown amounts of traditional ecolo ecological knowledge they held. Tribes are dedicated to the health of their people, lands, and fish and wildlife relatives, and preservation of their language and culture, but face many challenges. At the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society, several zoonotic diseases are on our radar as we work to provide technical assistance and overall awareness to the 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. The recent reports of SARS-CoV-2 and white-tailed deer are especially alarming as many tribal citizens maintain a subsistence lifestyle and are at a higher risk through increased interaction with wildlife. This amplifies the concerns chronic waste and disease already presents for tribal citizens. For example, there are tribal citizens, citizens that use the brain of deer and other big game for hide tanning, presenting a risk of exposure to the prions found primarily in the central nervous system of an infected animal. Tribal fish and wildlife professionals must balance the need to educate on risk and safety precautions without impeding important cultural practices. The highly pathogenic avian influenza is currently spreading across the country. Tribes must consider protecting the wildlife, the backyard poultry flo flocks necessary for food sovereignty and security while decreasing exposure risk for hunters. Avian influenza also poses an economic hardship to tribes with lost revenue from hunting licenses due to concerns with exposing hunters to known diseases and other tribal economic losses from lodging and food purchases. Avian influenza is impacting eagle populations as well. In some instances, eagle carcasses are not being collected or are being incinerated due to the threat of possible exposure to avian influenza. These eagle carcasses are lost important resources for tribes that need them for ceremonies and other cultural practices a resource that is already extremely limited with the National Eagle Repository reporting long wait times, up to 10 years for a whole immature golden eagle for tribal citizens. One of our most common requests for technical assistance at NAFWS is to help tribes identify funding sources. The inequity in funding for tribal fish and wildlife programs is perhaps one of the most obvious but least known issues in conservation work. We often see one person responsible for multiple complex issues in tribal fish and wildlife programs. We cannot expect one person to be an expert in everything that threatens and impacts our fish and wildlife relatives. Wildlife do not respect our political boundaries. Tribes must actively engage in every level of surveillance without compromising tribal sovereignty. To actively participate in surveillance, tribes need funding, and not only grant funding. Grants are, grants are incapable of providing a rapid response necessary for disease management. You cannot quickly respond with grant-dependent funding, nor fund the long-term monitoring necessary. 
Many tribes also lack the capacity to apply for grant funding and the reporting and compliance that goes with it. Adequate funding for tribes will help build capacity through staffing, training, sampling, and testing while ensuring tribes maintain data sovereignty. Without tribes involved, there can be pockets of unknowns or outbreaks in the 56.2 million acres of tribal lands. The very complicated jurisdiction also must be navigated. For example, if a zoonotic disease originates within a tribal reservation, what happens? Who becomes the lead? Tribes may be hesitant to report to a state veterinarian because of threats to tribal sovereignty and negative public perception of the disease or origination. Adequate funding, allows, adequate funding will allow tribes to develop plans instead of reacting to situations as they arise. It will allow for these plans to be built in cooperation with federal, state, and local agencies. In closing, tribes must be in included in preventing pandemics through wildlife borne disease surveillance. This requires dedicated, long-term programmatic funding for tribes to build capacity and the quick response necessary for disease management. Pilamaye, thank you. Uh, is, sorry. Thank the panel for its testimony, reminding members that Committee Rule 3D imposes a five-minute limit on questions. The chair will now recognize members for any questions that they wish to ask the witness. We're going to begin with recognizing the gentleman from California, Mr. Huffman, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I want to continue my line of questioning on mink farming. And uh, I realize that uh, our uh, window of jurisdiction is about wildlife and uh, the habitat that sustains wildlife and many of the witnesses are appropriately focused on that but when our oversight uh, authority uh, in that space uh, identifies a problem with much broader implications I think it's okay to talk about that too so um, I guess I would uh, I would bring my question back to um, Mr. Stalnicht uh, should we be concerned that USGS is finding elevated levels of COVID in wildlife surrounding mink farms? And uh, while we think about the wildlife and environmental implications of that, should we also be concerned about the broader implications of um, millions of these animals concentrated into these facilities where they are known to contract COVID pretty easily? to spread it uh, and to have mutations that can go back and forth between humans and mink. And as far as spill, spillover from mink farms to the surrounding wildlife, I, I think there is an area of concern. I, I, I don't think we really know what the implications of that are right now, to be quite honest about it. But it's certainly something that should be monitored. But we'll leave it at that. Okay. But as far as mink farms go, anytime you concentrate a large number of susceptible animals together under artificial conditions, especially wildlife, you present a potential problem. It goes far beyond well, that. And I appreciate the fact that we are doing the surveillance uh, work in the surrounding area. Uh, but I guess what I'm wondering is if, if someone can tell me, are we surveilling the mink farms themselves? Because it seems like that is a far greater concern if, uh, in terms of this pandemic. The worst thing we could possibly happen as we try to emerge from this pandemic, of course, is a mutation that throws a monkey wrench at us. Uh, and so if we are not doing that same kind of surveillance in the mink farms themselves, surveillance being maybe the first step, maybe more. I mean, Denmark euthanized, I think, 17 million of these animals because of a massive COVID outbreak in one of their mink farming operations. So. Um, do you know of any surveillance within the industry itself in these farms? Uh, I guess that's directed to me. I, I do. I do not. This is this is an area that we do not work in. Yeah. Uh, so it, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot there, but let me just ask if any of the other witnesses, you know, want to add to um, to what you have said or speak to the concerns that I'm raising, because I, I find it, um, you know, frankly, quite alarming. All right, well, uh, crickets then, <laughs> in terms of, uh, and I, I may need to just take up these concerns with some other folks uh, that hopefully uh, are on the case uh, and out there in these facilities doing surveillance and considering 
you know, interventions that may be appropriate. Um, but appreciate your testimony, Mr. Stolnick, and the other witnesses. Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes Mr. Heiss, the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and to each of our witnesses. We appreciate you being here a uh, great deal. Dr. Stolnick, I'd like to begin with you, uh, and, and I will begin by saying go dogs. Uh, welcome, UGA. Glad you're here with us today. Uh, in your testimony, you stated that there have been five pandemics and two near misses in your lifetime. Uh, and I'd like if you could to expound upon which country each of these viruses originated in. Could you do that? I'll, 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 I'll give you more of a region than a, than a, than a country. Uh, as far as the two, the two uh, influenza pandemics, 57 and, and the H2N2 and the H3N2, our best guess is that these originated from Asia. Pandemic H1N1 was actually a real surprise. And that actually originated uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, exact location, we don't know, but it, it really it resulted from some, some re recombination, reassortment events with, with swine influenza viruses. Um, HIV, Africa, and SARS coronavirus from Asia. Uh, Ebola, the new near misses, Ebola, Africa, and then SARS, the original SARS uh, virus from Asia. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so we, we have uh, multiple different places around the world, a couple from Africa, three from China, we've got Hong Kong, we've got Mexico. So, Ms. Simpson, let me come to you with this. Uh, can you describe, and I, I'll just use this one as a specific, uh, can you describe how China's Belt and Road Initiative has negatively impacted Africa's defense against these viruses? Thank you for that question. The Belt and Road Initiative is primarily a, an infrastructure initiative, but more than that, it's also a cultural exchange initiative. And one thing that's occurring within the context of Belt and Road is the promotion and expansion of traditional Chinese medicine um, along the Belt and Road. Uh, China is actively promoting traditional Chinese medicine um, as an alternative to Western medicine. And as part of this, we're starting to see more promotion of what we deem to be high-risk species as, as cures, including for, for things like COVID. So for example, the Chinese Communist Party was promoting pangolin scales for some time uh, as a potential cure for COVID. Um, we know that this is quack medicine, uh, of course. Um, we also know that it increases the risk of wildlife-borne diseases being transferred into the human population since pangolins are, are a species of, of particular high risk uh, for spillover. So has it negatively impacted Africa's uh, defense? Would you yes or no with that? I, I would say that there is an increased demand for high risk wildlife uh, as a result of this promotion of TCM, yes. Okay, so I, I guess I, the, the, the big question here that I have in my mind is if we spend more money in the United States, will that lead to more accountability for countries like China? I'm not certain it's an either or situation. I think that we need to shore up our defenses in the homeland um, for sure. Um, but we also do need to hold bad actors accountable internationally. Um, Wildlife-borne pandemics are a potential existential threat to humanity. You know, we've already seen what COVID-19 has done. We have nearly a million dead Americans, uh, 80 million sick, and that's just in this country. We've got a global economy that's been severely impacted by the pandemic. We can't do this alone. This has to be an international effort. And yeah, part and of that's that the problem. That's the problem. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's an issue that involves the international community. So just simply the United States spending more money does not mean this fixes the issue in China or in other countries, is that correct? It doesn't fix the, the issue in those countries, but it will make it easier for us to defend ourselves should they fall um, and um, not do what is expected of them. 
Yeah, and I and I get that, but we we have to do both. We have to defend our country and our people and so forth. But at the same time, others have to be held accountable. And simply us spending more money does not produce accountability elsewhere. And that issue must be, I believe, must be on the table. I agree. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Um, the chair will now um, recognize yourself for five minutes. Um, Dr. Thornston, what would it mean for the tribes that you work with to have dedicated, consistent funding? Well, I will tell you that for the most part, tribes operate in a uh, piecemeal type project for tribal fish and wildlife programs. They, they don't have any, there is no base funding for tribal fish and wildlife programs. So having dedicated funding that they can rely on, that will help to, to build uh, sustainable long-term programming instead of having someone that's focused mostly on reporting and, and securing their job through grant funding. So I think it would uh, definitely help to bring tribes to a, a different level and be at the table that they have been left out of for so long. Do you see it as potentially helping to improve coordination between the work, sustain the work that the tribes are trying to do, but then also bring that information and learning and connect it to the federal researchers and state researchers working on this? Yes, absolutely. I, I think um, it's not that tribes aren't doing the work. It's not that they don't want to be involved. It's that they simply don't have the capacity to be there. And it, they get a lot of ask to be in attendance or to be a part of something. But like I mentioned, we have, we have several departments that are one person, and they are dealing with everything from food sovereignty to fish and wildlife management to diseases. Um, you know, cultural practices, all of this is on their plate. So every, every ask is just an additional um, task for one person or, or under, understaffed departments. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Carlson, I want to turn to you. I want to understand um, what we know about the transmission of coronavirus um, from animals to people. So there are, I am aware of four probable cases of spillover into people from mink in Michigan that were recently disclosed, and all four had the same variant as the minks on the mink farm. Two of the cases were workers on the farm. I think we can understand how they might have gotten it. But the other two cases were a married couple with no connection to the farm at all. In your opinion, is it possible that the variant spread from the mink on the farm ultimately to the couple through community transmission? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, you know the the strength of genomic epidemiology is is that we are able to make these connections, right? Uh, when we see a connection like that, there must be something we haven't caught, and so we can piece together that there may be uh, a connection, most likely person to person, as not been observed. Now, I, I will say. Uh, my first training as an epidemiologist is is not to weigh in on on outbreaks I have not been pulled into. But um, yeah, I, I think we know this is a very transmissible virus. We know that it was very transmissible after it went from animals to humans the first time. It's likely that it continues to be transmissible human to human after uh, spillback and and reintroduction in human populations. Um, I, I don't think it would be any surprise to see variants that originate in, in mink or, or deer or any other species have onward transmission. And I think one of the um, concerns is without the kind of work that you're doing and without digging into that research, we can't accurately count how many wildlife related cases there are because we sometimes undercount when those go into the community transmission pile instead of the, the wildlife pile. And it can really, I think, suggest that we're but this is less of a problem and less of a source of disease than it actually is. Um, I wanted to ask you, I read with great interest the article about your work in the New York Times and I believe also maybe in Nature. Um, and so can you talk a little bit and share with us how can artificial intelligence be used to make predictions about wildlife-borne diseases? How can we leverage that to get the, the most um, benefit out of the investments that we do make in monitoring? Absolutely. Um, so uh, artificial intelligence is a, a big scary phrase, but it's, it's really just statistics running on a nice computer. Um, it's a way for us to make sense of co big complicated data, right? And so we are able to do things like look at the genomic sequences of viruses that infect humans and learn general rules about what a virus that could affect us looks like. 
training a computer to do that lets us work with large sources of data that are hard for us to kind of get in there and handle ourselves, like genomes, where there's maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of data points contained in one record. So artificial intelligence has a huge possibility to inform public health, to inform One Health surveillance, um, but it can only do that if we have sufficient data to power it. I'm so glad you mentioned that, because my last question for you is, is there any reason legitimate that I should accept as to why California, for example, doesn't share its data? There are challenges that arise around I think not just data sovereignty, but accountability for how we use data. Um, I, I can't speak for California, but I know that often when we, when we see data uh, withheld by agencies or, or made difficult to obtain it, it comes from the fact that um, because research is so underfunded, because surveillance is so underfunded, um, there are often concerns that if data are not protected, uh, they might not be acknowledged at all from where they came from. Um, and so this is, this is, I think, largely symptomatic of how under-resourced uh, the, the institutions that collect the data are. Now, whether or not that's legitimate is not mine to speak for. I, I do not work for the government. It is not mine to decide what happens with government data. Um, but I will say that for researchers, um, the best thing that we can do is, is have funded systems that are just flowing with data and there are, there are no concerns about scarcity. I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I, I think luckily for you, I am a government um, leader, and I do think that when we as taxpayers invest in data, um, that it ought to be shared as much as possible. And I, I was a professor before I came to Congress. I've seen this scarcity mindset that leads to a lack of sharing. But as you point out in your testimony, you know, the lack of, of data sharing can create noticeable holes in risk mapping um, and in risk prediction. So as we think about how to strengthen our disease surveillance system and how to make these investments, I think one of the commitments has to be that with those stable streams of funding comes expectations of robust data sharing and robust cooperation across agencies, including the works that tribes are doing. With that, I um, will now recognize uh, Mr. Moore for his questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I share your frustration or push to to be able to share data. We saw completely out of this context uh, the 9-11 Commission. The key finding from the 9-11 Commission was that intelligence agencies weren't sharing data for reasons of bravado or, you know, just sheer um, silos. There's, uh, other than that, it was pointless. And we've seen better collaboration going forward. So we know that our government can actually improve in this capacity. Uh, it's been a common thread through today's conversation. Um, Ms. Semser, I want to just thank you helping provide a more international perspective. And as, the, as Congress is about to embark on the, the conferencing of the two different China bills that existed from the House and the Senate, uh, I get to be a part of that conference process. It, I can't underscore the importance of the impact that China will have on any, on, 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 the, on the entire world. We don't, you know, we want to talk climate change all we want, if we don't get China under control, there's nothing that we can do about the amount of the effect that they have, the outsized effect that China has in a negative way um, across so many different factors. Your focus today on particularly with, with spread and pandemic and um, is, is key to this conversation. So thank you again for being here. Uh, can, you, uh, can you describe, just jump into how illegal activities like wildlife trafficking create environments that, um, that increase the risk of disease spillover between species? So in the context of wildlife trafficking, um, what we often find is that traffic wildlife is crammed together. Um, you've got suitcases full of birds or turtles. You've got shipping containers full of any number of, of different species. And as the other witnesses have discussed, when wildlife is crammed together in close, close confinement, um, the, the risk of, of spillover um, from one species to another um, and mutation is, is, is increased. Um, this is a consequence of, of illegal trade because the, the fact that it is a black market means that no one is, is doing any type of disease monitoring for these species. The, um, give, give us a sense for the increased risk with this uh, of spillover impact, the likelihood of future pandemics. So 
specifically with this issue and how it will ultimately af affect future pandemics? Well, I can't assign a number to it. Um, you know, I, I don't have the data to, to be able to do that. But unless we get a handle on illegal wildlife trafficking, um, we are likely going to see the risk of pandemic disease increase. Um, since the COVID-19 pandemic has broken out, um, there's been a lot of talk about increasing the global response to illicit wildlife trafficking, um, but we haven't seen much deployed on the ground. Uh, I'm on the advisory board uh, of the Game Rangers Association of Africa, which is the largest professional association of conservation and law enforcement officers on the continent. Um, frankly, a lot of, a lot of our, our members are struggling for resources, and these guys are the first line of defense um, in wildlife trafficking. These are the ones who are going to stop that pangolin or stop that civet from getting into that shipping container. Um, they're the ones who are going to potentially keep the bio threat close to the source of origin. Um, but the resources are, are, are just not there. And the pandemic, frankly, has made it worse because many of them were dependent on revenue from tourism, which obviously has declined in the wake of the global tourism shutdown. In, um and continuing with that in Africa, outside of just the containers and the, the, the supply chain issues, how have Chinese investments, whether it be the Belt and Road Initiative, led to unsustainable natural resource extraction projects? Well, when we talk about Chinese investments, you know, that is not a monolithic um, you know, area. Uh, McKinsey and Company says there's about 10,000 small to medium-sized enterprises um, that are owned by Chinese nationals operating on the African continent. And many of these are perfectly legitimate businesses. However, a, a unfortunately significant number of them are engaged in activities that are reliant on criminal activity or government corruption to, um, to, to produce what it is they're seeking to produce. And this is particularly prevalent in the forestry sector. Uh, where we see Chinese companies engaging in illegal logging, exporting raw logs off of the African continent to China to be finished. Um, of course, this deforestation, as I mentioned in my, my opening statement, contributes to the increased risk of, of viral spillover. Um, now, what happens to these raw logs you know, once they reach China? Well, very often they're made into furniture that we then purchase. So there is a very um, troubling loop occurring here. Um, that um, unifies our two countries and also puts us in a position to, to hold China accountable to make sure that its nationals are not engaging in this illegal activity, um, not enabling corruption on the African continent, um, and, and are, are enforcing their own laws to make sure that pandemic risk is not increased. And it's easy to, it's easy to complain about this. I find myself doing it quite a bit. We, it's easy to point the finger at what China is doing, both in their own country and in their investment opportunities across the world. Uh, welcome your input and expertise in helping us drive towards solutions. And we'll always be open to those, those ideas and collaboration. So thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Iowa, Ms. Axney, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Porter, for allowing me to wave on to this important subcommittee hearing. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Dr. Stalkneck, my great state of Iowa is the nation's leading egg producer and major turkey producer as well. So the current outbreak of highly pathogenic avian flu is of great concern to us, of course. Uh, 13 million chickens and turkeys have had to be depopulated in Iowa as a result of this current avian flu outbreak. And so understanding how we can better predict uh, and protect, protect against these wildlife outbreaks is going to be incredibly important as we continue uh, with the issues what we face in Iowa. Now, I understand that about 50 million birds died as a result of the highly pathogenic avian flu outbreak in 2015, and most of which were commercial poultry operations, and that the economic impact of that outbreak was in the neighborhood of about $4 billion. Uh, does that sound uh, correct to you? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Um, and the current avian flu outbreak in the U.S. has already inflicted some major damage. I, I, I hear about it far too often, quite honestly. About 31 million birds in the U.S. have been confirmed to be near active infection. Is it true that the vast majority of them, most of which are in commercial poultry farms, will also have to be depopulated? Yes. 
Okay, and for folks who might not know what that word means, that just means disposed of, that just means killed, correct? Correct. Thank you. Um, which way is that outbreak tending? And is it accelerating or is it slowing down? At, at present, it, it's, it's probably accelerating. Whether it will continue to accelerate is, is, is unknown. And that's, as, that's one of the kind of the areas that we're working in. The one thing we don't know is if this virus will persist in the wild bird population. And hopefully it won't, because hopefully if it doesn't persist, we won't have this threat year after year after year. And, and that's sort of our approach to this. It, we, we really are not going to get this virus out of wild birds. There's, there's nothing we can do. Uh, we can maybe manage a little differently to reduce the risk, but it's basically early warning and basically informing the poultry industry that, look, in August and July, there may be a peak prevalence. Be prepared. Uh, and I know that's not what poultry producers want to hear, but that is probably the reality of the situation. Well, thank you for letting, I appreciate that forewarning here. And I'm, you know, listen, uh, it might not be what we want to hear, but we should always know what's coming up. And I appreciate what you're doing to stay on top of this. But to be clear, I just want to make sure we address this. We found no evidence of spillover into people in the U.S. from this particular outbreak. Um, still, the National Academies has said that the outbreak of this type of virus could, in a worst case scenario, cause anywhere from 71 to uh, up to 260 million deaths in people. And while I understand that our monitoring of the outbreak is better coordinated and better funding than many others, and I'm so grateful for that, what can we be doing? Is there more that we could be doing to help reduce the damage uh, from this bird flu outbreak? And the other question I have is what are we doing well uh, in response to uh, the bird flu? I think, I think what we're doing well, what we did well this year is probably the early detection. Uh, from wild birds, and it was caught, and that was good. And it actually was quite fortunate because the surveillance was greatly reduced this year. And it was actually going on on only two flyways, uh, and I was not included in any of those flyways. So I, I, think, I think that's one thing we did well, but we need to beef it, beef it all up. Um, the, the one thing that we also, I think, really did well is we also did a really quick shift into the Mississippi Flyway uh, when we found it on the, on, the, uh, on the Atlantic Flyway. And that was a lot of impro improvisation, actually, uh, and working without funding and hoping that the funding would come. Uh, it, this is really a tough one. Uh, and you, you get basically, as far as reducing, the poultry industry is really going to have to take care of themselves as far as biosecurity, as far as shoring things up to, pre to prevent transmission. Early warning helps them do that. And that's about all I can say. Okay, so more better early warning, a continuance of the early warning, but uh, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, the best we can do at this point is just be prepared as well as possible. And know what's going on out there in the wild. Okay, well, it's why this hearing is so important so that hopefully in the future we can figure out a, a way to have less of these risks that we have to mitigate. So thank you so much for allowing me on the committee, Chairwoman Porter. Thank you very much. Um, and I believe that concludes our member questioning. Um, with the cooperation of Ranking Member Moore, um, I'd like to offer each witness the chance um, to make a minute or so of remarks, sharing with us anything else um, that you believe this panel would benefit from knowing. So we'll just go in the same order that we went for the questioning, as best as I can remember it. And so we'll start with you, Dr. Carlson. Sure. Um... I think just to respond to some of the things that have come up today, I think it is important to note that the landscape of risk is changing very rapidly for disease emergence. We are used to a world where there are three big drivers upstream, right? There's wildlife trade, there's agriculture, and there's deforestation. Today we've talked a lot about wildlife trade, particularly illegal wildlife trade. Now this is a major risk to the United States, we're a major importer in particular of exotic pets. Um, but a 2015 study 
by uh, researchers at UC Davis showed that out of more than 100 zoonotic viruses they looked at, um, I believe at least 90% could not be connected at all to wildlife trade or wildlife hunting. Um, if we focus on only one solution, if we focus on only one country, we will not stop outbreaks. And the future is a different place than the present. There's more climate change, there's more deforestation. We need to be able to move nimbly and, and pivot to that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stocknick? I'd like to just make, make two really quick points. Uh, a lot of the diseases that we are talking about today also have pretty severe wildlife impacts. And this is important for a Natural Resources Committee to understand. This, this outbreak of highly pathogenic influenza is also really having impacts on bald eagle populations. Uh, in Georgia, we've seen close to a 40% reduction in productivity on our coastal uh, nesting populations. And uh, the second thing I, I'd really want to sort of address, there's been a lot of talk on interagency cooperation and, and, and how, we, how we work together. Uh, with influenza, we are, SQUIDIS is also a part of the uh, NIH Centers of Excellence for Influenza uh, Research and Response. And everything that we get from the, from the wild, from a wild bird, we are actually submitting to NIH researchers to do the assessments to really understand the potential for human disease. And this is just another important sort of side product that, that, uh, that, that we get by just actually getting these isolates from, from, from the field. And I also would like to just sort of build on, on what was said about tribal preparedness and the lack of people. The, uh, the, the states are suffering from the same, the same thing. We, there are many states in our cooperative that have one person dedicated to wildlife disease throughout for the entire state. And we're talking about a lot of species here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Simser. Thank you. I would echo some of, echo some of what Dr. Carlson said. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to this. Uh, there is no magic bullet. And, and we do have to appreciate that this, this is a threat facing us um, as, if not more severe, than the terrorist attacks of September 11th that Ranking Member Moore um, you know, mentioned. Um, to that end, you know, we, we do need to work internationally. We need to work across borders. Um, at the same time, we need to lead our international partners by example uh, so that we can engage with this threat effectively and reduce its ability to harm us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thornsonson. Thank you. I think uh, one thing is tribes have recognized the interconnectedness between people, animals, plants, and their shared environments for time immemorial, the very definition of One Health. However, tribal voices have been missing. And, you know, tribes add a different perspective. They, they bring to the, uh, the cultural impacts that, that people might not regularly uh, think about with zoonotic diseases. Also, we're, we're very happy to see the, the new funding through um, the America Recovery Plan for zoonotic diseases and see tribes included in that. However, you know, grants, grants uh, oftentimes we have to write to the grant priorities and it, it undermines tribal sovereignty. It, it limits us, uh, it limits us in being able to, tribes to be able to write to their own and set their own priorities. And also it, it pits tribes against each other where there's a small pot of money where 574 federally recognized tribes have to compete and it, it undermines and it's hard to collaborate when you might have a neighboring tribe. It's hard to collaborate when you're after the same pieces of, of funding. And also having tribes, having tribes at the table, they'll bring up the unknown barriers that, that might be to funding such as matches, uh, new and complicated grant application platforms. And I would just really, I really um, urge you to consider self-determination uh, rather than, than grant processes in the future for tribes. There's lots of authorities through Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act that already exists that can help tribes to receive funding that would be more sustainable and, and dedicated and, and less burdensome to, to them. Thank you. Thank you very much for offering those concluding thoughts. It was very helpful. Um, before and during this hearing, experts have warned us that surveillance of wildlife-borne diseases is inadequate in the United States and that we may miss signs of outbreaks that could cause significant harm to human health, to wildlife, and to the economy. 
You as experts have told us that if we want better tracking, we need to provide consistent funding that doesn't pit stakeholders against each other. We need to invest in the infrastructure and the people who are already doing this important work, and we need to bring together people from different sectors with a diverse expertise to talk to each other and coordinate their efforts. I'll be putting together a bill to make sure that our nation is prepared to address these potentially serious risks, and I invite Ranking Member Moore and his colleagues to cooperate and collaborate on this process. I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of this committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. With that, the committee is now adjourned.